with that, I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Go, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much, Chris. We appreciate you being here today. You are very welcome. So I shared screens and then everything just went, wow. So uh, we're back and better than ever here. Lisa, thank you so much. And, and Caitlin for the introduction. Really, really appreciate being here. And uh, it means a lot to me and to Ferguson that we get to share in this journey with you all. So um, as Lisa said, my name is Chris Bogdan and I work with Ferguson Waterworks. Um, here at Ferguson, we're a national company. We work all over, the, all over the country and we're really, I tell folks, we're product specialists. I'm gonna to talk to you today about green infrastructure. There's lots of different ways to get green infrastructure done. And at Ferguson, we have a lot of products that can help things get done that way. Um, so we're all over the country. So I uh, have kind of expanded my borders a little bit. I'm so fortunate to work with our national team. So in addition to the Southeast, now we're really spreading this message around the country, which is very exciting for us because um, we believe in cleaning and protecting water here at Ferguson. And honestly, like Lisa said, I grew up here. We've all enjoyed Florida and we've enjoyed water in different ways. We live in a really cool and unique place, right? Um, there are so many different types of water bodies around us. 52, 51 magnitude one springs in the state that we can all go and enjoy. And I encourage you to do that. Waterways and water bodies are all around us, right? And I mean, this has been part of my life. My father would take me fishing when I was a young kid. And you get all these memories. I think about the proud papa in the background right there, right? There's so many ways for us to enjoy water and it starts young. You know, for me, I've got seven nieces and nephews. I love getting them out on the water whenever I get an opportunity. There's one of them right there, wore out from a full day on our boat. Uh, I was really fortunate to get a boat in the beginning of COVID. I really spend as much time as I can on the water because I just love it. It's so much fun. Uh, there's so many neat things to do, including bringing your puppy dog uh, out on the water. Um, and this was kind of a sad year for me. I will say the boat went away. We're in a new season of life, but Laura, my wife and I still enjoy water every time we can. I kind of joke and I say, I tell people, I always keep a noodle in my trunk. Uh, number one, I think it's the most versatile and best raft that ever existed. If you, uh, if you disagree with me, then please send me an email on a better raft because I'm always looking for a better way to float in the water. But noodles are compact and small and I keep them in my trunk because you never know when you're going to need to be floating around in the water, right? So um, I like folks to know a little bit about me because I want you to know why I'm so passionate about what we're doing and uh, where we're going. And quite frankly, it's sad. I mean, Lisa hit on it a little bit. You took, just think about in our backyard, the Indian River Lagoon, we've had some of the largest fish kills ever in the recorded history in the past few years, but this is a problem all over the state, right? Beaches are closed, we can't fish. If you live in Tampa for the past five years, you weren't even able to harvest a fish out of those waters, pretty much from Naples all the way up to Tampa because of uh, challenges in the waterways. So. We've got to do more to protect this water body. And that's why we're here today. I actually got this slide from Lisa. Thank you, Lisa, um, for giving me this awesome slide that talks about where does pollution come from? Well, it comes from a bunch of different places. As Lisa mentioned, um, fertilizers, septic tanks, agricultural stuff, and essentially all these activities when it rains, water hits the ground, it picks up all those pollutants, and then it carries them to places wherever that water ultimately goes. So um, for many, or for many, uh, sorry, discharge points or where the water normally goes is a pond or the Indian River Lagoon or a river or a creek. At the end of the day, all roads lead to the ocean. And unfortunately for us, they also take a little stop in the Indian River. So I'm gonna identify or define what green infrastructure is before we start talking about how it works um, or, or examples of how it works. So first and foremost, on the left-hand side, this is what I like to call gray infrastructure. Think about gray being concrete, right? So if you go any, pretty much any, any uh, property you go on to, water goes into a drain, that drain goes into a pipe and that pipe goes to some type of a water body. Sometimes it's a retention pond on a property. Sometimes it's a river. Sometimes it's directly into the Indian River Lagoon. So we call this gray infrastructure. On the right-hand side of the screen, I kind of like to say before we came and put up a parking lot, essentially before we came here and started building things, Mother Nature looked a lot like that, right? When it rained, the water hit the ground. It probably soaked into the ground. Maybe it traveled along the, along the surface and found its way into one of those receiving water bodies. But 
it pretty much stayed where it was at. So what green infrastructure says is we want to hold the water on slight, slow it down, spread it out, and hopefully soak it in or infiltrate it into the ground. Uh, take this opportunity, I'm going to show, share a series of slides from my buddy Jeff Huber. Um, he's a landscape architect down in Fort Lauderdale. He wrote an incredible LID manual uh, while he was at the University of Arkansas. Free online tool, Google University of Arkansas LID manual, and you will find one of the coolest LID manuals I think that's out there. So real world example, left side of the screen, gray infrastructure, right? All the water that hits the ground gets collected in drains throughout the parking lot. Maybe it hits the roof, it's going in roof drains, and then it all goes back here to this guy. That's a, B, a best management practice, a wet pond, BMP. I like to call BMPs big muddy ponds. We don't like those, right? We wanna go over here to the right-hand side of the screen. This is green infrastructure. Same exact idea, grocery store, but this was designed, all the stormwater management lives in all these green spaces so many unique ways to capture water. And if you look at the right and you look at the left, do you see some similarities here? Oh, I see some landscaped areas. They're not being used for stormwater management. So again, on the right-hand side of the screen, we're gonna utilize stormwater management practices within the property. Another example of that, neighborhoods. Think about where you live. Look at the curb lines. You see these big drains right here, right? They're all over the place. Where's that water going? It's going to all these receiving water bodies or ponds or lakes. And contrary to what a lot of people think, when the water ends up in this lake, it's not done. Eventually, it makes its way to places like the Indian River or maybe the ocean. So again, this is an example of gray infrastructure. We're going to talk about green infrastructure. Why is that really important to us? Well, I hear lots of stuff these days about infrastructure, infrastructure. infrastructure. We got to make our infrastructure better. Well, why? Think about many of the pipes that move water underground right now. They were probably put in the ground 50 years ago, 60 years ago, maybe 100 years ago, and they were put in the ground to manage a certain amount of people, which built out a certain amount of land or a certain amount of impervious area. What's happening everywhere I go around this country, we're growing. Populations are doubling, tripling in some communities, but guess what's not changing? Those pipes. So these pipes that were built to manage a certain amount of impervious area 50 years ago, they don't work anymore. The pipes are full and therefore when it rains, those pipes can't take all that water and we tend to see some localized flooding. The other problem or challenge we have is our buckets are full. If you live in the coast and you're watching this, you live over in, the, in Brevard County or maybe Volusia County, go look at where the pipes, where all that water's collected in your city or town and go look at where the pipe goes out into the river, the creek, the stream. Um, this was in the O'Galley River in Melbourne. These pipes are totally full of water. Years ago, you could see these pipes. Heck, I remember crawling around some of these pipes. Don't tell my father, but crawling around some of these pipes when he would take me fishing over in the Indian River. You could go in there. There were crabs in there and neat stuff. I'm not putting scuba gear on to go in these things this day. So I like to say the bucket is full. We can't put any more water into these places that we've put, either because there's nowhere else to put the water or think about the Indian River Lagoon. It's just too polluted. We can't keep putting dirty water in that lagoon. So the bucket that we tried to use for 50 years, we can't rely on that anymore. So where are we gonna put the water? This is what green infrastructure does. This is the cool thing. Green infrastructure essentially takes stormwater management and folds it into the landscape. So these are examples of green, of, uh, green infrastructure practices to the left. And we're gonna highlight some of these today, but there are a number of different things that I won't cover today um, that you can use to manage water. I like to think of green infrastructure as creating small pails. If we can't use that big bucket, that big old body of water anymore to dump everything into, we need to look for opportunities to park that water or put that water upstream. Little pails. These aren't going to be big, huge ponds, but when you start to put a bunch of little pails together, it equals one big bucket. So it's a different way of thinking about stormwater management. I'm, I, I challenge you, it's a fun challenge. Go find green infrastructure in your town or city. You're gonna have a hard time doing it because most all you're gonna see are drains and pipes and ponds. So this is a different way of thinking about managing water. Again, this comes from my buddy, Jeff Huber, parks, not pipes. This was a really cool project that he worked on in Arkansas, 17 units, really cool little community. There isn't one stick of pipe on that whole entire property. They're managing water using the natural landscape. 
look, this little community even has a great little park promenade. They've got this low lying meadow down here where they collect water. So this is a very different way of thinking about stormwater management. Pipes, not, or sorry, parks, not pipes, right? We're gonna talk about how that works. Why is this important? Again, I really like highlighting the whys because it really matters different to different people. Municipalities, this is the number one people or folks that I look out for because these folks all have to manage water under state permits or regulations, right? So implementing green infrastructure practices mitigates flash flooding, recharges aquifers, reduces nutrient discharges. Um, think about reduces, or, sorry, pressure on municipalities to clean other people's water. Private developments all up and down the road well, when, when rain hits the ground, some of that water is managed on their property, but a lot of it runs off and becomes the city's problem. That's dirty water. Now they have to manage it. That's very expensive. And it adds tax revenue for municipalities. Municipalities are not getting paid for big muddy ponds, BMPs, right? Big muddy ponds. But when you fold all that green or all the uh, stormwater management into the landscape, now all of a sudden there's no more big muddy pond more revenue for uh, municipalities. I absolutely love that. And then for developers, another big people we got to think about, what do they care about? Oh, uh-oh, I think I got my, uh, my uh, animations mixed up. Not really, but all they care about is money. That's the only thing that matters to them. And that's okay. You know, they want to increase their lot yield. They want more project revenue and they want to maximize ROI. And I say that's okay for this reason. Folks, everywhere I go, development is happening. So we have a choice. We can either embrace development and try and do it in a much healthier way, a much more holistic way where we're actually managing and taking care of water, or we can try and fight. But I haven't seen that fight win very much because every single time I look around, there's a new building going up or there's a new development happening. And so I say we embrace development that's happening and let's look at doing it in a more holistic way, which we can totally do with green infrastructure. Uh, go here. Um, so benefits of green infrastructure, again, you're going to hear the triple bottom line. This is somewhat of a new term in green infrastructure or in stormwater management. And what it's saying is we have an opportunity as designers, as landscape architects, as anybody to create these spaces that are built to think about the environment, think about social impacts, and then also think about economic impacts as well. We talked a little bit about the environmental benefits, reduce, pollu reduce pollution into body bodies of water, reduce flooding. From a social standpoint, man, we can create some really cool places for us to gather and get together. And hopefully, we're seeing a lot of downtown revitalization happening. Hopefully, when we revitalize these areas, make them prettier, we can implement green infrastructure, gives businesses an opportunity to thrive. So instead of maybe just thinking about one entity, we really try and look at stormwater management in a holistic way, saying there's a triple bottom line benefit if we use green infrastructure practices. There are some challenges for green infrastructure in general, public perception, lots of different things that influence why green infrastructure isn't happening. And I'm going to highlight some of those things. Lots of folks will say, well, green infrastructure is just too expensive. On the left-hand side, pavers. You see these all over the place. They're pretty. They're decorative. On the right-hand side, permeable pavers, which we're going to talk about here in a little bit. That means it lets the water go through rather than making that water run off and go find a drain. It's too expensive to maintain. Picture on the left, this is probably every single garden you're gonna see at a commercial property. Picture on the right, a rain garden in Cocoa Beach. What's the difference really, right? I see a big wall here. I can't get stormwater into that area. There's still plants, I gotta trim those plants. There's still ground, I gotta weed those gardens. It's the same thing over here on the right-hand side. There are a little bit more maintenance practices involved, but at the end of the day, we're talking about gardens, folks. And then this is my favorite. It's too expensive to repair green infrastructure. On the left-hand side, what happens when a pipe breaks? We get to dig up that pipe, dig up the roadway, get to that pipe. Oh, we're going to plan for some resiliency. So let's turn that 24-inch pipe into a 30-inch pipe. That's going to solve all our problems. Got to get that water out of here. Um, and, and on the right-hand side is green infrastructure. Maintenance is right there at the surface. We can see it with our eyes. We know when it's not working. And it's really easy to get to. It's right on the edge of the roadway. We don't have to close roads to fix these things. And then Lisa touched on this earlier, but differences in stormwater code and development code. Lots of us stormwater folks are thinking, we got to update our stormwater rules and regulations to allow for green infrastructure. We're doing it. But guess what? There's development codes and ordinances and things that are getting in our way of allowing these practices to be implemented. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on this. Thank you so much, Lisa, for mentioning this, but come join us. 
Lisa and Dr. Bean have put together this amazing program. We're going to focus on code. Let's get the foundation right. If we get codes right and we allow green infrastructure, now we can really have some conversations about how to implement it. So come out and see us this year. Um, we had an amazing time last year collaborating with so many different professionals. Come see us again this year. So let's get into what is green infrastructure, some of these practices. Rain gardens, probably the most common uh, green infrastructure practice you're going to hear about. Incidentally, I'm using green infrastructure a lot. You've probably heard low impact development. Depending on where you're at in the country, those two terms are kind of uh, transferable, but here's a rain garden. So essentially, it is a garden. You can put all kinds of different stuff in this thing, whatever you want. In the top, this area right here, you're typically going to see what we call like depression storage. Water is going to be able to go in there and it's going to be able to be stored there so that it can infiltrate down into the ground through some type of a soil medium. We'll talk a little bit about that. This is an example of an underdrain system. So if you've got some soils that are pretty poor, which in many areas in Brevard County, they don't drain, they don't infiltrate. Don't worry about that. There's ways that we can store a bunch of water so it doesn't flood out areas, process that water through some type of a media, maybe to clean it, and then discharge that water safely into a receiving water body. After it's been cleaned and taken care of, now we can safely distribute it. So a couple different parts, again, is going to be a storage zone of a rain garden. You're going to have some type of a media for the rain garden itself, and then water can either infiltrate into the ground or we can collect it in an underdrain system and then send it wherever we want to send it to. And here's some examples you'll start to see. These things look all sorts of different ways and different things. I pulled this one from Houston, Texas. Notice depression storage. So when it rains, look, all the water can just sheet flow right into here and be collected and flow down into the ground. Um, so we can create these things as big or as small as we want to. And they can be really pretty and elaborate like this. A lot of times when I see these at parks, this is kind of the rain garden I'll see. It's hard to tell, but notice there's still a depression storage. So when it rains, water can store or stage and, and store up in here. See right here, there's a little pipe. Maybe there were a couple drains around here that were collecting water and putting it into here. So water can be stored. And then what we can't see underneath this is all the soil that's allowing the water to go down into the ground safely to infiltrate. More examples of rain gardens. And again, you're going to see this is in Cocoa Beach. There's just a little bit of storage in there where water can come in off the street, go into the garden. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways to get these things in here. I love pretreatment. You know, if you're not using pretreatment devices today in your rain gardens or your bioswales, I strongly encourage you to do so. Collect all that garbage and trash right here. Don't let it get back into these pretty little rain gardens, right? So there's tons of different examples and ways that we can use these. And I love this system in this picture because it really tells what we're trying to do with green infrastructure. This is called a traffic bump out. We use these things often to either slow traffic down or create a brand new space where we can put a rain guard, right? So if you notice here, water is going to flow down the road this way and down the road this way. One sec, I'm going to swap something because I don't feel like I'm looking at you guys. That's not going to work. Sorry about that. Technically, I'm just, I want to be looking at you, but I'm looking at a different screen. But either way, traffic bump out. Um, so look right here, drain, right? Remember what we said about gray infrastructure. We want to, they're going to have a drain. It's going to go into a pipe and that's going to go somewhere. We can utilize and implement green infrastructure to intercept water before it gets to this drain. So water's going to come into the system here. Water's going to come into the system here. You notice a very small area of depression storage up here. That's going to allow water to kind of stage up and store in there. And then it drains down into the ground. Now, this is very important. These rain gardens can't take all the rain that hits the ground. They're not meant to. Guess what? Neither can the ponds that we've been designing for years. That's why a lot of times you'll see flooding or localized flooding in your area. So what these systems are built to do is manage a certain amount of water. And when it rains really, really hard and these systems can't take all the water in, well, then the water just keeps flowing downstream and it goes into that conventional gray system. Awesome opportunity to talk about resiliency. Folks, think about this. If those pipes are full of water or that bucket is full of water, what would happen if we could put in a bunch of green infrastructure, some pails to maybe handle that first 10 minutes of rainfall or maybe handle that first half inch of rain and we can park it in a rain garden and it doesn't go down this drain? Guess what? You just made your stormwater system work significantly better without even ripping up the road or replacing a piece of pipe. 
I think green infrastructure is the number one way that we're going to combat the things that are happening in terms of rain events, flooding, and pollution control. And this is an awesome example of how these systems are meant to work. Take that first flush of water. Let's try and put it back down into the ground or hold it back. And when it rains real hard, then we'll rely on the municipal system. Really neat way to think about managing water going forward. Uh, rain garden maintenance. How are we going to maintain these things? Well, first and foremost, folks, again, pre-treatment. Let's gather all that garbage and debris right here, right? But let's say that all this, let's say that's not in place, which most times it's not, and all this stuff goes into our rain garden, right? First and foremost, plantings. We plant plants all the time. We do bunches of different types of plantings in our own yard. Every spring, my wife and I go out and we add a couple new butterfly plants and flowers to our garden. That's normal, right? So adding new plants, no big deal. We're doing that every day. But what happens maybe if this rain garden stops flowing water? Maybe all this garbage and debris got into our rain garden and now it won't let water go through the soil or surfaces anymore. Pretty simple, guys. Take out that media that you were using, put some brand new media in, put some brand new mulch in, put your plants in, and you got a brand new rain garden flowing water and taking, thing, or, uh, and, and taking water out of or keeping it out of the municipal system. This is a very, very simple process. Typically, we tell folks once a year, they're going to replace the mulch. Uh, in these systems, traditionally, mulch is a really good uh, tool. We use that tool to grab TSS, what we call total suspended solids. So we're capturing a lot of that debris before it gets down into the media. So when we take that mulch away, we're typically taking a lot of the debris away. We put the mulch back in the springtime, and our rain garden keeps going. It's really only catastrophic when the media gets clogged. So Again, I think maintenance is a heck of a lot more simple on these systems. Um, you've heard bioswales as well. So essentially a bioswale is depression storage. I'd like to think of it of a rain, as a rain garden without all the fancy plants. Notice, still have depression storage, so we can still store water up in these systems. You can see some pretreatment devices. I think this was a very responsible design. We've got overflow built in right here. So when it rains way too much, water can still get out of our system rather than flood this local area. Um, and traditionally, bioswale simply means biological activity or there's some type of an altered media that goes in this area that's essentially trying to promote cleaning the water as it drains down through the soil. And we'll talk about uh, an example of that here in just a little bit. Tree wells, another awesome example of green infrastructure. Folks, again, open up your eyes. I love this. Walk through downtown Melbourne. Go walk through, um, uh, through Cape Canaveral. Go walk through any real city street and what you're going to see are these tree wells, right? Places where they put trees in concrete. Well, guess what? These things aren't really built to manage water. And this is what we do to these poor trees. Let's just put a little big box of concrete in the ground and let's stick this tree in the ground and then let's hope that it gets big and it thrives. How's that gonna happen? So there's some really neat innovations in stormwater management. These are called suspended pavement systems. And ultimately, the reason they're called that is um, I'm using an example from a company called Green Blue Urban. There's tons of different examples of this, but essentially, uh oh, wrong way. Uh, essentially, some, some type of structural storage down below, which gives some open spaces for the tree to both sit in and allow its roots to grow big and strong, right? It's also allowing water to come into this system. So there's actually curb cuts and things that are in here. You can see in this picture down below here, there's some pipes. So that means that we're collecting water and we're sending that water somewhere. Well, guess what? We're collecting water in these big, huge storage systems like you're seeing right here. And then we're holding onto that water. A lot of the times, a lot of that water is used by the tree for evapor or for, um, so we're getting rid of water because the tree's taking it in. Evapotranspiration is happening. And then if there's just too much water, we'll let it go downstream. We call these suspended concrete systems because think about how much weight or pressure is in a piece of concrete. When it sits there for years and years and years, it's compacting that soil. It's not doing anything to help the tree. So these are called suspended pavement systems. They're going to keep the, uh, the, the, uh, the tree healthy and strong and allow us to take in stormwater from the street to process it. Porous or permeable surfaces, again, probably one of the most used practices. Um, just took a, just a generic example. You've got a paver right here, right? If you think about normally an asphalt, concrete, what happens when it rains? Water just keeps on flowing and it finds a drain normally, right? Well, what these porous or permeable surfaces do is it allows water to actually enter right where it rains. So when you got this system up here, there's a bunch of different ways to get this done, a bunch of different products to get it done. But 
ultimately it rains, water goes through there. There's traditionally some type of a stone layer below that. The stone layer does a couple things. Number one, support so that these systems can take full traffic loads, fire trucks, you name it, many of these systems can take it. But it also creates a little reservoir, a little place where we can store water. So when it rains, water exits the street right down into our stone reservoir system where either A, it can infiltrate into the ground, or I showed you an example earlier where you could put under drains on this system and collect the water and then send it down to a receiving water body. This example also has some media in it in this section, which we're going to talk about in just a second. So some examples. And again, folks, there's all kinds of different examples. Um, this is one called Power Block. This is an open joint paver. You can really see these big gaps in here. Water flies through there. We love using these in parking spaces, as you can see here. On street parking, your downtown retrofit areas, your little downtown communities that we're revitalizing. What a great, cool way to add aesthetic, um, aesthetics to the community but also stormwater management. Now, when the water comes flowing off this road, it's gonna go in the ground right here. It's never gonna find that drain, which ultimately finds the lagoon. I'm gonna keep using that example, okay? So pavers are one example. Porous concrete is yet another example. This is a cool little product we work with called Stormcrete. These are porous concrete panels that you can lay down in place. So we work with a lot of municipalities that'll add walking paths or walking trails, but they don't wanna add concrete because they don't wanna add more runoff. Check these out. They're already built like sidewalks. Um, when we're doing commercial projects, we love using these in parking spaces. Um, the more you drive on a porous or permeable surface, traditionally, the more it breaks down or the faster it breaks down. So we like to try and keep these out of heavy traffic areas where we can. Uh, we're doing a lot of really neat stuff in gutter lines. I'm going to show you an example of that here in a minute. But again, think about it. When it rains, if we could get the water into the ground right here, instead of letting it go find some drain and find the lagoon, we're protecting those downstream water bodies, right? Green alleyway projects, we're doing a lot of these in real urban cities. This is up in DC where we're actually converting these alleyways behind homes, putting in a porous concrete gutter line, and now we're letting that water go into the ground rather than again, go into a drain. Some other neat things you think about every time you take a pup for a walk or maybe go for a walk with your friends or your family. On the corner, you've got these little grids that have little bumps, right? They're telling folks, hey, we're coming to a crosswalk. A lot of times water will stand on these corners great little tool to put there on the corner to let water drain down. And that's how we're seeing a lot of municipalities use this. This is from the city of Cocoa Beach, uh, old community, old parking lot, and it's probably been regraded dozens of times, right? Well, guess what? Now the water just sits here. It's got nowhere to go and it's going to stay there until mother nature takes it away um, through evaporation. So this is a great tool to just cut that little area out and drop a couple of these porous panels in. Again, remember what I said, water can go through them. So this is a great way to solve some local ponding issues in your area in addition to, to designing a project. Um, and then there's some of these cool grid systems, these plastic grid systems that you can either put stone in or you can put soil in. So this is, again, there's so many different varieties, but this is from a company called EcoRaster. Um, so grid system, it's plastic. You put stone in there and then check it out. You can drive on it. Why do we need to keep using asphalt? Why do we need to keep using concrete? These systems are traditionally less expensive. And when it rains, the water can go down through them. Really neat stuff. We can do grass in them. So I love these when I think about, um, my parents used to call them flea markets. We're fancy now. They're farmer's markets. But I have, I've gone to several farmer's markets their own grass areas. Well, guess what? If you use a product like this, you can drive all kinds of big trucks all over it. You're not going to rough that grass up. And nobody really knows that there's anything under there to structurally support vehicle traffic. Industrial applications for your municip municipalities, you know, normally we build these access roads so that we can maybe get back to, to an area where there's a stormwater practice or something along those lines. A lot of times we use 18 inches of, uh, of uh, sorry, stone to get that done. This Eco Raster product is about yay thick and you stick it on the ground and you fill it with rock and you're all done. You never get those ruts. You never have to worry about maintaining it. And when it rains, water can just go straight down through it. So some unique uh, pro or sorry, applications for how we put in permeable surfaces and how do we maintain these suckers? Well, right here, vacuum trucks, right? Most people have vacuum trucks in the municipality and they've come out with these really cool, neat little walk behind units now. I love these units because they've got little spray wands on the bottom. So they actually spray out 
all these little cracks and crevices that you see, and then they vacuum all that debris out and take it into the truck. This was actually done at the University of Central Florida. This was a test done on these pavers. They ultimately were just trying to clog them completely, right? Maintenance has to happen on all these things because we know, remember what we talked about earlier, stormwater runoff is gonna bring in not only pollutants, but sediments and trash and things like that. Those things clog these systems. They will clog over time. And when I say clog, I mean, basically water won't be allowed to go through them anymore. Maintenance practices aren't as hard as people think. And you can bring those pavers back to 100% as if they were just put in yesterday and water can keep going through them. Traditionally, we say paver maintenance once every six months to a year really depends on what we call the contributing area or where's the water coming from and how much debris does it have in it. Um, you can add media. I've talked several times about media. So one of the media we love using and we're so fortunate to have here in our state of Florida is Bold and Gold. Um, this media was invented at the, at the uh, University of Central Florida's Stormwater Management Academy. Media are made up of all different things. This particular one is made of sand, clay, and tire. And when you put it in a best management practice, uh, a green infrastructure practice like a rain garden or a bioswale or under a permeable surface, as the water goes down through the media, it's cleaning it. It's taking out nitrogen and phosphorus and bacteria. And here in the state of Florida, Bold and Gold is one of the only tools that we have that's approved by the DEP and the water management districts to remove nitrogen and phosphorus from uh, stormwater runoff. And you can do that for your total maximum daily loads, um, your BMAPs, and also for your ERP permits if you're designing some type of a private project. And Rainwater harvesting. I was digging through some old archives. I thought, I'm going to show some really neat stuff. Rainwater harvesting. These pictures, I took them in Pompeii. Over 2,000 years ago, people were using green infrastructure. Little hole up here when it rained, they captured the water in the cistern and then they used that water for their daily living. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways to perform rainwater harvesting. The most common way right now is water rains on your roof. Water goes into those little roof drains, and those typically go to a rain barrel, which, by the way, MRC has them available. Talk to my buddy Steve Sharkey. He'll help you out with a rain barrel. We could put them in underground cisterns. But essentially, we're holding that water and saying, we're going to use it for, for, for ourselves rather than uh, let it go into the Indian River Lagoon. Um, at Ferguson, we do all kinds of things to support engineers and municipalities and help them figure out how do we get green infrastructure to work for our community or how do we get green infrastructure to work um, for our project. So we offer all kinds of great support services, including public outreach. Love seeing green infrastructure projects go in. You're probably normally going to see a plaque. Why? Well, this is relatively new. So they tell us all about the wonderful things that green infrastructure is doing to reduce local flooding and protect our water uh, from nutrients. So I'm going to show you a couple examples. This is in our uh, my little my new little favorite town, Cape Canaveral. I always thought this was Cocoa Beach. I've lived here 40 years, and this is the exact road I drove in on every single time my dad took me fishing. Uh, but this is an old community, and it's probably 90 to 95% paved. And this is what it looks like up close. Look at all this. Where in the world can we put green infrastructure? You know, I don't even really see any green opportunities. Most all of this is private property, so we can't use that space. Um, there's drains all throughout this community and they collect the water and they send it over to the Indian River Lagoon. That's why that lagoon's polluted folks. Well, we look for opportunities. What met with some, some of the great staff and team over there at Cape Canaveral and we said, man, the city's got a lot of these bike lanes. And we know from experience, we can put porous concrete in these bike lanes. So instead of letting the water collect in this drain and enter the drain systems and take that dirty water to the Indian River, we're going to put in some porous concrete, and this is what that looks like functionally. There's a porous concrete panel at the surface. Not really going to get into it today, but there's an opportunity to utilize underground storage technologies. Remember, I talked about those rock reservoirs before. We can replace that with different types of products that are more efficient than stone at storing water. So we can capture and hold a ton of water in these tanks, and then we're going to put some bold and gold media in down here at the bottom. This is just a smaller cross section of that. So concrete at the top, storage tanks down below, and then bold and gold media before it infiltrates down into the ground. So we're collecting water, preventing it from going into the Indian River Lagoon. And as we put it back down into the groundwater, down into the aquifer, 
we're going to take nitrogen and phosphorus out of that water so that it's nice and healthy and clean when we deliver it back. Uh, another project we did, Convair Cove right here. This is the city of Cocoa Beach. If you're familiar with these areas here, ocean, Indian River. Um, so look, same situation as in Cape Canaveral. Huge, 97% of Cocoa Beach is privately held, which means the city can't do anything to put water management in those areas. But we found some really cool opportunities. So here's Convair Cove sitting in the middle of Cocoa Beach. Here's a little zoom in a Convair Cove. Man, I tell you, every time I walk these pro properties, I think who designed stormwater systems 50 or 60 years ago? I don't know how it makes any sense. When it rains, water's collected in a bunch of drain pipes and it goes out into this body of water, which is the Indian River Lagoon ultimately at the end of the day. So we recognize sheet flow, water, every time it rains, it's flowing down this road, it's flowing down this road, and then it starts flowing down these two roads and it goes out in the lagoon, totally untreated. Lots and lots of runoff. So how do we solve that problem? Well, we did a really cool project called Convair Cove. Essentially, we turned this street right here into a pervious, a pervious surface. Here's how we did it. I got a couple cool pictures. I mentioned those storage tanks before. I put some storage tanks under the road. I think the UPS man's here. We put some storage tanks under the road here. I'm going to apologize for a sec. Sorry. Hang on one second. The joys of webinars. Um, uh, so we put storage tanks under the road. We put permeable, part, uh, sorry, permeable uh, pavers on top of that. So when the water comes shooting down the roadway, now the water goes straight down into the ground in this roadway. And then at the end of those roadways, there's the canals that connect to the Indian River Lagoon. Ooh, ooh, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so here's the canal back here. So whatever water can't go down into these pavers, it goes down, flows. This is a bioswale or a rain garden. You know, we just learned, look at all the plants. There's bold and gold media in here to clean the water before it goes out here into the lagoon. So we're using a permeable surface. We're using rain gardens and we're using an altered media and bold and gold all to manage storm water and basically try and keep that water from going into the lagoon. Really, really neat project that we had the opportunity to work with the city of Cocoa Beach on. As I end this thing, I ask you a very big question. How are we going to manage water in the future? Are we going to make pipes bigger just so we can get dirty water to the lagoon faster? Or are we going to look to green infrastructure to help us solve problems? Folks, I think we need to be looking at green infrastructure. On the right-hand side, we have a persistent visitor here. Hang on, I'm sorry. I'm going to take a second break, and I'm literally on my last slide. Hang on. Just a reminder at this time that if you have any questions for Chris when he um, ends his presentation, to please put them in the Q&A, not the chat. Thank you very much. I am so sorry that ring would have kept going. My uh, repairman's a little bit early. Last slide. On the, this is Melbourne. On the right-hand side, this is what Melbourne looks like. Look at all the ponds. We know this is a decentralized stormwater management system, meaning it rains, water goes into those ponds, and eventually goes to our lagoon. Do you think this is gonna stay this way forever, folks? Everywhere I go, we're building. What are we gonna do with this land over here? Are we gonna do this? Or are we gonna do something a little bit different and really try and protect our lagoon? I really hope we start using green infrastructure to manage water going forward. And I take uh, my last slide here, my wonderful wife and I down in Keys fishing. And uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. Sorry about the uh, pause at the end there. And it's Q&A time. Thank you, Caitlin. You know, these things are going to happen, I guess, with these webinars. So. <laughs> we sure are. <laughs> I just got a dog, too. So I understand you completely. But thank you yeah. so much for rolling with it. We'll get started with the Q&As. Um, our first question is, what are the best budget-friendly pervious options for parking and drives? Well, of the products that we offer, I would say the grid systems are probably the most cost effective. Those are those the, the plastic product I showed you where you can fill it with stone or you can fill it with um, a soil and then grow grass in it. I think that's the most uh, cost effective. Second, I would say uh, pavers. 
And then third, I would go to a porous concrete surface, a porous pavement or surface. That would kind of be the order or rank that I would put them in. Gotcha, awesome, thank you. Um, our next question, I would be concerned about the long-term effects of using recycled rubber as a media. Same with using plastic products. Can you address that issue? Yeah, great question. And so my history in stormwater management started in 2015, working with Dr. Wanalista in the university on that Bold and Gold product. So I know lots about recycled rubber because we put recycled tire in the Bold and Gold media. Um, the, in that specific product, 99.9% .9 metal free, meaning anytime that we, we source that, that tire product, we ensure that it doesn't have any metal in it. We've done all, and I say we, the University of Central Florida has done test after test after test since 2007 to prove that there is nothing leaching or coming from the bold and gold. Most of the stuff we hear on the news or see on the news is from actually breathing holding, or breathing in a rubber product. Um, and that is not happening when we put it in a box or put it in the ground in a stormwater management application. So there's nothing that we can actually breathe in. So. Um, it is not harmful the way that we use recycled tire in bold and gold. And we've got a lot of data to support that. In terms of the plastics, yeah, I understand, you know, we use a lot of recycled plastic. So that eco raster product that I showed you, 100% recycled plastic. And it's really cool because it's made of bags, recycled plastic bags, which is a very challenging thing to do. Um, so we try and find ways to be uh, really sensible about the products we use. Those tanks that I showed you, by the way, that were storing water underground recycled plastic as well. So in many instances, the products I showed you today are, are doing good things to help the environment, but we do need to be mindful of plastics and, and tires and things of that nature. Awesome. Um, are you doing any stormwater projects currently in Melbourne? Melbourne is amazing. They are the king of baffle boxes. They are really uh, an example for the state. We're starting to use them uh, as case studies to show other communities how baffle boxes can help protect water. Now we're starting to look at some other things to do there in the city. I know that they've got some great plans uh, for some downtown redevelopment. They've got some of those cool tree wells that I showed you. It's not the same product. It's a different one, but they've got some tree wells scheduled to go in and we are looking to work with them on ways we can implement some of the other things we showed you today. So yeah, I would say Melbourne's really honestly a leader in Brevard County in protecting that lagoon. I think, they've, I think they're up to 15 or 18 baffle boxes now that they've installed. Really big commitment to protect that waterway. Awesome. Um, next question, would you consider natural wetlands as green infrastructure? For example, Vieira wetlands or Orlando wetlands that help clean and filter water? A million percent. I probably should have put like two slides in here about wetlands. I love constructed wetlands. That is an amazing green infrastructure practice. Essentially, it's just building what we would have used to have thought about as a pond, but we don't like BMPs, big muddy ponds, right? So constructed wetlands, um, I really should have put that in here. Constructed wetlands are essentially um, man-made ponds that flow water through, slow water down. They're regional facilities that take a lot of, um, of stormwater in where they didn't exist before. And one of my favorite things about them, they're amenities you're gonna see walking paths around them. Both projects you just mentioned have great amenities for folks to go around and, and enjoy. There's normally what they call littoral shelf planting. So you'll see plantings around the edges that attracts birds and wildlife. So in addition to being able to go jog in a really neat spot, now I got all kinds of really cool wildlife to look at. I think constructed wetlands are one of the coolest stormwater um, advancements that we have going on right now and love seeing those things go in uh, when communities put them in. I really love it mainly for the residents because um, I think it's an unintended consequence. Most times we're putting those facilities in to store a bunch of water and kind of try and reduce flooding or reduce nutrient discharge. The unintended consequence I think has been a brand new cool amenity for tons of residents to really enjoy. So I love those as green infrastructure practices. Awesome. Um, kind of related to that question is, why don't municipalities protect wetlands more? Hmm. <laughs> well, I work for Ferguson, so I don't really know that the answer to that question. I would say that, uh, you know, I, I think we're learning as we as we go down this journey together um, and showing you some of those pictures I showed you of, uh, you know, Cape Canaveral and Cocoa Beach. We've learned a lot since 1960. And so I think we're finding more holistic ways to design those systems and protect those systems. I didn't highlight too much on it today, but we show, I, I did show you a couple of pre-treatment devices. So we're really starting to try and build treatment trains. You know, and what we mean by that is 
maybe use a baffle box to clean the water before we put that water into a constructed wetland. Um, so we are seeing advancements. People are definitely thinking a lot more about it. And I think you'll start to see um, more designs that include pretreatment for those facilities. And in some instances, I didn't, you know, I've only got so much time. Um, we're actually using Bold and Gold Media on the discharge side of many of those systems. So as we're as those systems let water out, uh, we're pushing them through a bold and gold media and that's cleaning the water before it goes to the next water body. So we are holistically thinking about that. There's tons of different ways we can do it um, and it's being done today. Awesome, thank you. Um, how about measuring impacts before and after these projects that you mentioned? How effective have they been in measurable terms? Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, Convair Cove is being measured right now, the one that I just showed you. Um, they're, they're actually looking at what we call influent or the inflow water, and then they're sampling the water right after it leaves the system or the effluent. So we can see what immediate impact all of these systems have on cleaning water. Um, so not only like Convair Cove, but you can think of baffle boxes. City of Melbourne does an excellent job of looking what's the water, what's the pollutant load coming in and what's the pollutant load immediately leaving that system. It's very important to uh, measure these things. We got to know, are we doing the right things or do we think we're doing the right thing, but we're not really doing the right thing. And, and the other thing that I would say is many of the grants that municipalities get, whether that be from the state or maybe from a water management district, a lot of times those have um, sampling and monitoring requirements. So, um, you know, as part of the grant requirement, if you're going to take the money from us, then we want to know how your system is doing. So uh, monitoring is is very common. Uh, it happens all the time. And I think it's a very healthy thing to do. Wonderful. And then this is the last question that we have time for today. Um, and it's a good one. So I'm going to generalize it a little bit because I think it's very useful to everybody. Um, this person is specifically referring to Pinellas County, if you have experience working with them. Um, they're looking for people that they can reach out to. So um, who are who are the people that residents of any county can reach out to if they want to learn more about their stormwater in their area? Um, so Caitlin, I want to make sure. So who can who can who can folks that live in a community reach out to to learn more about their stormwater? Is yeah, that in if general? they, if okay. they want to make if they want to make more green infrastructure around their area, who should people reach out to to learn more? Typically, uh, well, every city, town, community is going to have a public works facility. Some have stormwater, some have natural resources, some have all parks and rec. There's all kinds of different departments um, within a municipality to help uh, regulate, manage water in different areas. But even if you live in a really teeny, teeny, tiny community, you're going to have a public works department. That would probably be the best place to start. Um, there, I tell you, communities are really proud when they are implementing green infrastructure practices and protecting water. We all want to protect water. So I would say reach out to Public Works. That'd always be the best first place to go. They're probably going to be able to tell you about green infrastructure stuff they've done or plans they have. And quite frankly, we're all in this together. Talk to your local politicians. Talk to Public Works and say to them, guys, we think there's a better way to manage water. We sat through this little uh, webinar and we learned about green infrastructure. Call someone at Ferguson. We'd love the opportunity to work with anybody and, and, and talk to them about how this stuff works. Thank you so much, Chris. That was a wonderful answer, and we really appreciate you uh, presenting for us today. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, MRC. It's really been wonderful for us to, um, to assist you all in the great work that you're doing. Just really, really uh, enjoy being around the entire team over there. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. Absolutely. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time, everyone.